Going into 2023, there is a lot of optimism for the year ahead in biotech. Though 2022 presented some challenges in the space, what exciting breakthroughs could lead the charge in the coming months? How are companies and investors looking at the risks and opportunities ahead? Joining us now to discuss is George Ankopoulos, co-founder and chief scientific officer at Regeneron, and Hartaj Singh, managing director at Oppenheimer & Co, covering biotechnology. So George, let's dive in here right now with you and the biotech land landscape in 2022. What was the shift you think that we saw and the advances that we're taking away from last year that are going to pave the way for success this year? There's been a lot of excitement over the last few years that we are finally, maybe after many years of promise um, and, and less than satisfying results in the field of cancer and particularly immuno-oncology. Um, there were breakthroughs about 10 years ago that we thought were going to bring us a lot more uh, advances uh, than we've actually seen. Now we think we're on the brink maybe over the next couple of years of really seeing those advances that we've long hoped for in cancer and particularly using immuno-oncology approaches where the body's own immune system can fight back against the patient's cancer. I also think that the field of genetic medicines, I think the last decade or so has really in many ways been dominated by what we call biologics, biologics, medicines, antibodies, and so forth. Uh, I think that the hope is not in the next year, but over the next decade or so, there's going to be a movement with big advances in the field of genetic medicines where we can really target the genes and even change people's genes to actually impact and maybe even cure some diseases. Hartaj, as George just laid out, it's not just one year and then the next. To be a biotech investor, you need to have some patience here. This is decades in the making. But what do investors need to know about the biotech sector as we head into the new year? Because there has been a lot of right sizing. There have been some changes that have been happening. What are you expecting for 2023? So 10 years ago at this point, uh, the NBI index was about 400 million in market cap, yeah, 400 billion in market cap. It's 1.1 trillion right now. Still 3x up after two years off, you know, not a very good biotech team. Uh, there were about 150 companies in the index at that point. Now they're close to 300. Um, you know, the amount of investment into biotech just increases year on year. Um, you know, we tend to focus sometimes too much on things that don't work, but we've had some, you know, pretty amazing medicines that have come into the market over the last 10 years. We've cured a disease, you know, hepatitis C with Gilead and Pharmacet. Now, in terms of 2023, yes, we've had a rough 2022 and the year before that. There've been a lot of investment. There will be some companies that will not come out of this, um, you know, but again, uh, those companies that will, will benefit tremendously. I do think that this will be the year that uh, companies like Regeneron with their business development uh, focus, uh, you know, will move forward and look at opportunities, whether public or private, more and more, uh, identify the winners from the losers. Uh, so we look to that as being, you know, more uh, a 2023 trend than a 2022 trend. So George Regeneron has had a lot of success. And as you said, you focused um, on immuno-oncology and also um, genetics medicine. You had one word that got me kind of excited. You said the brink. And so what, what does it take to, to get over that, get those advancements and to have that, that pivotal year or two where we, we make a huge breakthrough? I do think that the media, um, people who are not in the business, they want these amazing breakthroughs to occur, you know, this year. Um, and it's really a long game. And I think it's dangerous for us to trivialize the process uh, of how hard it is to come up with these truly breakthrough drugs that change people's lives. But what we do see sometimes is we see the fruition of many, many years and often decades worth of, of research that then culminates and then we see it. And some people think it happened that year. But like I said, immuno-oncology may be on the brink of these sorts of breakthroughs um, in terms of seeing something that the field and many of us have been working on for so many years to really get to that next level. At Regeneron, we develop what we call a co-stimulatory bispecific that can help the first class of immune uh, agents in cancer the PD-1 antibodies, these co-stim bispecifics. And what we were able to show in early small studies is we could take cold tumors, classes of tumors that almost don't respond at all to these immune therapies. And this particular was 
prostate cancer, and we could get up to 75% of patients in very small numbers having very profound, almost complete responses in patients who were last stage, essentially incurable, less than a year to live. And this raises the possibility that this program and this particular advance where we're combining two classes of immuno-oncology agents may be now taking us to this next point uh, in the field of immuno-oncology and now get not just a small percentage, but a very high percentage of people having profound responses. So we may be on the brink as a field in immuno-oncology in particular, and these are the result of you know years, decades uh, of efforts, and we're hoping that the next year or two or three may be where the, the fruition occurs and we start seeing larger studies that really validate this and, and really bring hope to the so many cancer patients uh, who really don't have that hope today. Right. I mean, hard to everything that George just laid out there. I mean, you can't snap your fingers and uh, have this happen. It's hard work uh, year after year. What's the outlook then for investors? Like, as you look at large cap, mid cap, small cap companies, what are we going to see this year in terms of IPOs? Does M&A come back? There's there's all this hard work that's happening. Everybody's very hopeful that it's going to, to come together and there's more hard work ahead. What does it mean, though, for investors right now? You know, I think in 2023, we've been calling out what we call a bifurcation strategy, uh, you know, which is that companies that are clear winners in the small, mid and large cap space will stay winners and will keep on continuing to do well. Companies where the science was too early, maybe too risky and don't prove themselves will fall by the wayside, which happens with biotech. But I do think 2023 will be a stock picker's market uh, for biotech. And the companies that do well have meaningful, clinically relevant data will um, you know, surpass expectations in terms of valuations. And George, just to talk about um, you know, the future and, and what you're seeing, and I, where you're talking about like the media is looking for headlines. And I think for sure, everybody wants to open the New York Times and say like, cancer cured. I get that that's you know, not how it goes, but what is it going to, you know, in your mind, take to get to that, that space? Because as a cancer survivor myself and talking to other people that are waiting for those big breakthroughs, for the consumer part of it, what do you have to say to them about what the future is looking like? Like, are you optimistic? I'm always optimistic, but I do think that we have to uh, recognize that science is a long game and it requires a deep commitment and investment by society. And that by underestimating the challenge of innovation, how hard it really is to cure diseases. Artaj mentioned hepatitis C, which is a disease that can be considered for many people cured uh, with treatment. The problem is outside of infectious diseases, and some rare cancers, and we're hoping to be changing that in the next few years, there's very few major diseases that you can actually say we have cured ever. And I think the danger is in underestimating the enormity of the challenges that we have to keep up with the increasing burden of disease that we have in society today. So I think that sometimes the media and also us in the industry by trying to highlight the successes, it leads to dramatic underestimation of what it takes. We have to be doing things as a society to engage and inspire the youngest but best brains that we have out there to take on all of the challenges and not only the disease, but other existential threats that face society today. And so what I would really be focusing on if I was in the media, if I really wanted to make a contribution, was not heralding the breakthroughs that are coming, but pointing out how long it takes to do them and how we have to invest much more deeply at the society level. We need to be focusing on, let's do better. Let's engage the best and the brightest at the youngest ages. By, by supporting the programs that we can support to get them in there. As a society, let's talk about how important it is to do science and to invest in science. Have we learned these lessons? What is the, the overall trajectory here in terms of where we are right now with all of the challenges that George has laid out? Is the industry ready to take on the challenge? 
I'll answer that question in two very simple ways. One sort of empirical and one quantitative, right? Empirically, the question is, you know, do you want to be any politician all over the world who's not ready for any pandemic or even an, you know, a small health crisis that's coming down the pipe after experiencing 2020, right? I think politicians, uh, government um, representatives, NGOs are much more sensitive and I expect greater investment, uh, greater sensitivity, greater uh, care so empirically, you just see societies and governments all over the world being much more sensitized to health. We're living longer, the quality of life needs to be better, so investments need to be there, as George said, um, you know, in a decade-long kind of fashion. Quantitatively, I'll just say this. The bottom line is that you know, we've just seen a massive IPO and secondary window in biotech over the last three years, something we'd never seen before. Uh, the longest windows we'd ever seen were for about a year or two years. Um, you know, so we're starting to see now more and more investment coming into biotech. Uh, NBI index is only one trillion in market cap. Think about it. That's one half of an Apple, one half of a Google, and that's 270 companies right now, right? What, where will that be 10 years from now? You know, five trillion, 10 trillion in market cap. So uh, I think that the pandemic has actually in a strange way left us better because it sensitizes to the issues of human health and longevity that George is talking about. And we will, you know, I believe make the investments uh, therefore. George, I'm going to give you the last word here. I, going into 2023, let's say you're a kid, you just graduated from college, you're trying to figure out what to do. How would you inspire somebody since you are looking at the next generation and trying to get them to rise to the challenge? What do you have to say to them to pick up the baton here? I think we have true existential threats facing humanity ranging from disease to climate change. The best way that we can fight back is to use science. These problems are challenging, but they are solvable. Uh, and they're solvable by the best and the brightest committing themselves to doing it. I don't think there is a more noble endeavor uh, than you can commit yourself to than to try to use the power of science to make a difference and to enhance the quality of life and the chance of survival of our species. George Ancopoulos and Hartaj Singh, thank you both so much.